Hello class, and welcome to Ministry Practicum. I like teaching this class because it gives me an opportunity to share with you some of the practical advice that I've learned from more than 30 years of ministry. And the first bit of advice that I'm going to give you may shock you, but it needs to be said. If you're not sure you want to go into ministry, and if you're not sure you're called, don't go. Just don't go. The ministry is a difficult profession, and getting there is even more difficult. I would rather have you back out now than to get in the ministry and then later find out that it wasn't where God had for you. So a lot of the things I'm going to be saying in this particular video are going to be shocking for you, and they may be hard for you to take, but you need to hear them anyway. If God is calling you in a ministry, He's going to make it abundantly clear, and nothing that I can say or anyone else can say is going to be able to persuade you from it. But I do encourage you to think very long and hard and carefully if you see yourself headed for the ministry, because the dangers out there are great. The rewards are great. It's a wonderful job. Life is a wonderful job, but the dangers are great as well, and you need to hear what they are as you consider whether or not you're called to the ministry. Many are called, the Bible says, but few are chosen. Many people feel a calling to the full-time ministry, but in reality, few of these people will have long-standing ministry. Most of them will not stay in the ministry for their entire life. Pay attention to these statistics. 80% of seminary graduates do not stay in the ministry longer than five years. 15% of foreign missionaries return home after a single year due to burnout and depression. 32% of planted churches and church planters will die within four years. The ministry is one of the highest professions for clinical depression. Churchgoers expect their pastors to juggle an average of 16 major tasks. Pastors who work fewer than 50 hours a week are 35% more likely to be terminated. 90% of pastors work more than 46 hours a week. 80% believe that pastoral ministry affects their family negatively. 75% report that they've had significant stress-related crises at least once in their ministry. 50% feel unable to meet the needs of the job. 40% report a serious conflict with a parishioner at least once a month. 40% of pastors say they have considered leaving the pastorates in the last three months. 19% of pastors have been forced out of the ministry at least once. 6% say they've been fired. 33% of pastors confess to inappropriate sexual behavior with somebody in the church. 20% of pastors admit to an affair while in the ministry. 56% of pastors' wives have no close friends. 70% of pastors do not have somebody they consider a close friend. Now, these statistics are not all bleak. Here are some of the positive statistics. 86% of pastors said they'd choose the ministry as their career if they had to do it over again. Now, these pastors are pastors who've made it through the first few years. 87% of pastors say a strong sense of God's call is why they chose the ministry as a career. 91% of pastors feel very satisfied about being in the ministry, and 75% say they want to stay in the ministry. Let me emphasize, however, these are the ones who have been able to survive the first few years. Here are the sources for that information. You can look at them in your leisure. Now, what makes the ministry so hard? Four things. First, there's a lack of knowledge about what the job entails. If a person enters the ministry without a love of God and a love of people, he'll find himself a poor fit. Unrealistic expectations of success is another. Just because God, because God calls us does not mean that God calls us to succeed. Sometimes God calls us into the ministry as a learning experience, not as a succeeding experience. Then there's, of course, satanic attack. Satan hates ministers, and he's harder on them than anyone else. Then there's our inability to manage our personal lives. 
Many people who feel a call to the ministry are not practical people. They're not sensible people. They're people who are idealists. And as idealists, they always think that God is going to somehow protect them from their own foolish mistakes. This is not so. In the ministry, you have to be practical as well as spiritual. And in financial duties, difficulties due to borrowing money and not being able to pay it back is one of the big reasons that people fail. Now, the first step in the ministry is this. Make sure that it is God calling you and not your own ideal. Christian calling has a threefold meaning to it. First of all, there's the general call of all the saints. And this is most important. Remember, everybody, no matter who they are, is called to serve the Lord. Even if you're working as, as, a, as a cook in a restaurant or a mechanic or a garbage man, you're still called to serve the Lord. The specific calling to a branch of ministry is something different. This is the job of the ministry. It is the area in which we live out our general calling. This calling to a specific branch of ministry must be confirmed by the body of Christ and by circumstances. Don't assume that because you feel called to the ministry, you are called to the ministry. Then there's the calling of a specific person to a specific ministry, such as a pastor being called to a church or a mission field. This is a purely, purely personal sense of calling that we must feel individually. Now, I want to look at all three of these separately. Let's start with the general call to all Christians. The general calling of a Christian is absolute, permanent, and the same for every Christian. This calling includes repenting of our sins and living a holy life. Everyone's called to do that. Representing Christ in the flesh in our earthly lives. We're all called to do that. Sharing the good news of Jesus with everyone. And increasingly striving to worship God and to imitate him on earth. We are all called to live lives that resemble Jesus on earth, that we may be aware of him everywhere. Mark 1.17 is the first beginning of those calls where Jesus simply says, follow me. To be a disciple is to be a follower of Jesus. All Christ followers are called to be part of the general mission of the kingdom of God, the Great Commission, Matthew 28.18-20. Go into all the world, making disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe wherever I teach you, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Being his disciple means carrying on his general work on, on earth. As we find it in Luke 4, 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the freedom of the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind the release of the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. But beyond that, there's a personal call. That is that inner voice that says we are particularly are called to minister as ministers or chaplains or evangelists or missionaries within the body of Christ to some special work. In Protestant churches, there's an acknowledgement that personal call is universal. There may be examples of it in the Bible, such as Moses in the burning bush, Jeremiah 1, Isaiah 6, Matthew at his counting table, Paul on the road to Damascus, just to name a few. In all these examples, a person is set aside for a particular ministry. Now, whether or not you are working within the church as in full-time ministry or not, God has a personal call for your life. The calling to Christian work, however, is not absolute, nor is it permanent. If you're called into the ministry, you have a choice whether to go or not. God is not going to hold it against you if you don't. Many people are mistaken when they consider themselves called into the ministry. So we need to be very careful that we are not one of those that, is, that has mistaken our own personal desires for God's call. There can and are many ways in which Christians may fulfill the general calling to live a holy life and to witness for Jesus other than going in the ministry. Now, how do we know if our calling to the ministry is genuine? Well, here are three signposts that must fall into place. First of all, there must be the witness of the Holy Spirit. Is the Holy Spirit pressuring us to go? Has there been a confirmation of this pressure over a long period of time? A person should never follow what he or she thinks is the leading of the Holy Spirit unless he has been, had adequate time to evaluate whether or not it really is the Holy Spirit. We can often be deceived by a momentary whim. 
If it is indeed the Holy Spirit, it will not let go of us until we follow him. We need to make sure that what we're following truly is God's call for our lives. This specific calling will have three characteristics. First of all is energy. We will discover that when we are performing what God has called us to do, such as teach or preach or witness, we're going to be more energized than when we're not. Second is passion. We will want to do it. It will be the most important thing we can think of doing in our lives. And the third is peace. When we do it, we will know that peace in our hearts. If we're doing anything else, we will not experience that peace. Then there's the witness of others. If it is truly our calling, others will see it in us as well. We will have people whom we trust, who we know, who know us best, who are godly, who will confirm this call in our lives. Our friends often know our strengths and weaknesses better than we do ourselves, so we should talk to our friends, our pastors, and those in authority over us. The first thing we should do when we think we're being called is to go to others who are both spiritually discerning and know us well and ask what they see in our lives. Then there's the ecclesiastical calling, or that is the witness of the whole church. Now, this is vital to us for several reasons. First of all, it's a check against our own sinful nation nature. Our thoughts and feelings can deceive us, but if God speaks it to the whole body of Christ, it's more likely to be of him. As a confirmation of the body of Christ, of our gifts, when we are chosen by a church, a presbytery, or a bishop, we're covered with the authority of that group as well when we do that work. Authority in our lives is vital and of a great help. It's also an action of submission and humility. If we're to serve the body of Christ, we have to serve submissively and humbly. And before we can leave, we have to serve. Jesus said, if you want to be the leader of all, you must be a servant of all. If we don't learn how to serve and be humble before those over us, we, will, we can never expect other people to serve under us either. If we are not willing to submit to God, given authority over us, we are not fit to exercise that authority in the church. Then there's a witness of circumstances, not just our witness, not just the witness of, of the church even, but circumstances must line up to make it possible for us to serve God. Even if we are convinced that we are called and our friends confirm it, that doesn't mean the timing of that calling is right. God also works through our circumstances to make the path clear. God uses circumstances in our lives to enrich our experience and our understanding. When the time is right, the means will be made available. If God does not make the means available, it probably means that the time is not right. Along with these three signposts, we also have to, there also are three stop signs that warn us of a false call. First of all, we are never called contrary to scripture. If there is something in our conscience that is fed by a proper knowledge of scripture and it tells us that we are not ready, we should not go. God will not, for example, call us to abandon our children or our wives to fulfill some imagined call to the ministry. Neither will he call us to lie, cheat, or steal to fulfill a calling to the ministry. We are never called to ignore our family. If we feel called to the ministry and our wives, uh, and our wives don't feel that, or if we, if we know that that calling causes harm or detriment to her or our children, then we must wait until God opens the door and she is ready to go as well. Married people are not called individually without our spouses. Since we are one flesh, both of us need to go in. So our spouses are very important in the decision whether or not we, make, we follow up. We are never called to violate our consciences. If fulfilling a call would cause us to compromise our views, then that calling is not from God. Furthermore, if we're seeking a call, if our seeking a call puts us in financial bondage, it is not God call, God's call. God does not want us to be in bondage financially in order to fulfill a call. Now, there's one exception to this that I need to make clear, and that is the call of necessity. There are times when there is a need to be filled even if we don't have everything in mind, we, somebody must do it and we are there and we're the only people who can do it. If our life in preparation makes it possible that we may fulfill a need that nobody else can, we need to jump in and do it. <clears throat> However, if God has not provided for us to complete the preparation that it takes to fulfill that need, then we have to conclude that we are not the person to fulfill that in full-time ministry. 
And we must not think that this is a reason that we should not pursue getting the education and the credentials to, to fulfill our general call in some other fashion. Let me talk to you specifically about borrowing money. I mentioned financial bondage. Borrowing money is what puts us in financial bondage. Let's talk about why borrowing money is bad. Proverbs 22.7 says that the rich rules over the poor and the borrower is the servant of the lender. If we are to be in God's people, we must not ourselves go under servitude to others by encouraging unmanageable debt. Romans 13.8 says, Owe no, more, no one anything but love each other. Debt ties up our money and our time so much that it makes ministry difficult or impossible. Get out of debt before you go into the ministry. Psalm 38.5 says this, The wicked borrows and does not pay back. Not paying a debt is a form of theft and disqualifies us from ministry. If we're reneging on the debt, say our student loan payments, we should not be in the ministry anyway. We do not qualify. Be wise before you start in the ministry. Do not borrow money to prepare for the ministry. It will impede your ministry forever. If you must borrow money, borrow only the minimum you need. Don't borrow, borrow more than tuition. Don't try to live on loans during this time. Do not borrow money to prepare for unpaid ministry. Educational loans were intended for people who needed an education to prepare for a job that would support them and enable them to pay the money back in the future. The value of educational loans is only for those who will use that education to pay back the loans. If you are interested in the Bible it's in it for purely personal reasons or to be a helper in a Sunday school or a church, you can find great educational opportunities on your own in churches or in free online courses. But by incurring debt today, you will impede your freedom to serve God in the future in general calling. In summary, remember these three kinds of calling. There's the general calling. Everybody has that. There's a personal calling. Not everybody is called to go into the full-time ministry. And there's the ecclesiastical call. Even if you are called in the ministry, you need to wait until you're called to a particular ministry of the body of Christ. And when you are called, these will line up. You will experience a confirmation internally by the Holy Spirit. You will have others confirm your call. And circumstances will make it possible so that you will know it is time to go. My friends, I am urging you to pay attention to what I've told you in this video. I am warning you of the dangers of trying to go into the ministry unprepared or ill-advised. You can serve the Lord anywhere. Don't anybody ever let you think that somehow minister, ministers are the only worthwhile way of serving the Lord. Or full-time ministry is somehow better than anybody else. You can serve the Lord in any occupation in life, and I encourage you to do so in every occupation. But don't let a, a desire to be up front in a church take you into a place that God doesn't want you to be. Don't go into debt to get there. Don't go in ill-advised or try to ministry without full preparation or without the witness of the body of Christ. You need others to make this important decision in your life, to help you make it with you. Seek the Lord. I love the ministry. I love the ministry I've had over the, over the past 30 years and would give nothing for it. But I've also seen people who have been tragically misled into ministry. And I don't want that for you. Seek the Lord very carefully before you call yourself call to it. And I promise you, God has something great for you to do in your life, for every one of you. And I ask you, seek him and pay attention to what he says.